before I start, I just want to observe that Mr. Bonner and I are from the same generation. You can tell, right? Jeans, <laughs> no tie, sport coat. Okay. To build off what he just said, it's critical that we use our criminal justice resources in the most intelligent manner possible. We should be smart about that, which means making important distinctions based on the needs for public safety and protection, but also for the rights and resources available to individuals who commit crime. And that's what my work is about. When I talk about my work, almost inevitably somebody brings up the topic of Minority Report. It's a movie by Tom Cruise. It's set in the future when Tom Cruise is a police officer who has an interesting job. His job is to prevent crime. The way he prevents crime is he receives forecasts about crimes that are likely to occur, where and when they're likely to occur. And his job is to arrive on the scene with backup to make an arrest before the crime occurs. It's called pre-crime. If you are arrested for a pre-crime, you're prosecuted as if you had committed the crime. But the good news is the crime hasn't occurred. Now this movie has some positive information and some negative information. The positive is that forecasts can be useful for allocating resources, and that's good. It speaks to a future where that kind of forecasting becomes more and more possible. The downside, of course, is that there are risks, like with any new technology. And in this movie, of course, it wouldn't be a good movie without it. This forecasting system runs amok. Now, this kind of summarizes the future, the past, and kind of where we are. The left-hand side is Minority Report. The forecasting is done by individuals called precogs who have psychic abilities. And they can tell you when and where crimes are likely to occur. Of course, that's fiction. But in the fictional setting, it's very effective. The fact of the matter is, though, criminal justice organizations forecast all the time. When a judge sets bail, the judge is determining whether or not an individual is likely in the future to return for trial under a certain penalty and financial penalty if they're not there. When parole decisions are made, parole boards make forecasts about how an individual is likely to do on the street, and that affects the parole decision. When uh, police officers intervene in a domestic violence incident, they make forecasts about the likely course of that household over time. And if the risks are sufficiently high, they'll make an arrest. So forecasts are with us everywhere. Unfortunately, they're like Johnny Carson's The Great Karnak. They're based on, too often, craft lore, clinical judgments, and seat of the pants assessments, which too often don't do a very good job. Where we are is somewhere in the middle. I call this real cog as opposed to precog and no cog. Real cog involves the use of massive data sets, powerful computers, fancy algorithms, and lots and lots and lots and lots of data. To develop profiles, I know that's a sensitive term, develop profiles of the individuals who pose different levels of risk to society. It turns out that we're getting better and better at this. We're not in the world of Minority Report yet, but I think there's no question we're heading there. The only question is how fast and what sort of oversight we're going to provide for this process. Now, just to put this in context, forecasts of criminal behavior, that's not a new idea. Since the 1920s in the United States, parole boards have been using forecasts to help determine the decisions that they make about to release somebody. In the early days, this was done primarily with clinical methods, craft lore, hunches, seat of the pants. Over time, those forecasts were bolstered by statistical tools because it turns out that even very simple statistical models will forecast more accurately than craft lore or clinical judgments. Over time, those models have become more and more sophisticated, although uh, somewhat disappointingly, we really don't know in past work how well those models really do. Part of the difficulty is they haven't been properly evaluated, or if they've been evaluated, um, the information is often proprietary, so it's hard to tell. But of late, we're taking very seriously this notion that if you want to use a tool to forecast, you have to demonstrate that it works well. Despite the fact that we don't know for sure, especially for these older tools, what works and what doesn't work, around the country, legislatures are moving forward requiring forecasts of risks all the way through the criminal justice system. So in Pennsylvania, where I live, there's a statute passed two years ago that requires sentencing judges to take into account 
future risk, future dangerousness as it's called, when they go ahead and sentence somebody. And they're supposed to use the latest technology available to make those forecasts. Now you can forecast all kinds of things. What you forecast depends upon the policy setting in which the work occurs. You can forecast homicides, for example. Uh, you can forecast whether or not an individual will traffic drugs in prison. You can forecast whether a child is going to be the victim of child abuse. You can forecast whether, for instance, business firms are violating OSHA worker safety regulations. You can forecast whether someone will not experience an arrest at all, a good guy, while on probation, and so on and so forth. There's really no limit to what you can forecast as long as the data are available. The settings I've already alluded to, I can be a little bit more specific. In criminal justice settings, forecasting is used in police apprehensions, bail recommendations, charging decisions, sentencing decisions, prison housing decisions. Inmate comes in the front door. As was just mentioned, prison's expensive. You can go to Harvard for the same price as you go to a high security prison. You want to allocate those scarce resources to the individuals who really pose a significant risk to themselves and others. So you make a forecast who those individuals are and allocate those high-risk individuals at high security. The others you can put in the equivalent of a college dorm at $5,000 a year rather than 50. Parole decisions. And in addition to decisions about who to parole, once a person is out on the street being supervised, you can use forecasts to help shape the sort of services and the, types, and the kind of oversight that's required. Now, this really isn't new. We live in an actuarial society. It's not just criminal justice. Every time you go through your browser and an advertisement pop up, it's because some business firm has been following your clicks and makes a forecast then about the sorts of advertisements to which you're likely to respond. Every time you buy an insurance policy, whether it's cars or houses, the insurance company has figured out from past experience how to forecast for you whether you pose a significant risk leading to a loss. And they affect your premiums uh, uh, accordingly. College admissions are shaped by forecasts about how a student will do if they're admitted. Again, it's everywhere. Criminal justice is, in this sense, no different from every facet of society where increasingly forecasts are being used to shape what we experience. And increasingly, this is being done with the sort of technology that I'm going to talk a little bit more about. Now, in the case of criminal justice settings, what do we use for predictors? If I want to know whether an individual who I'm considering for a parole release is likely to commit a serious crime, what do I use? Well, I use the obvious stuff for starters. I need to know something about their personal background, their attributes, their biography. Things like, for example, whether they served in the military, where they're going to be released, their age, gender. Yep, most violent crimes are committed by men. It's important to know if the person you're releasing is a man or a woman. I also need information on their prior record. No surprise, people with prior records are thought to be at greater risk of committing serious crimes. And this can be broken down in all sorts of ways. For example, I need to know not just what was committed, but at the age at which the commission occurred. Crimes committed early in life are much more predictive of future problems than crimes committed later. If I commit a crime right now, an armed robbery, it doesn't predict anything. If I committed that same armed robbery at 10 years old, you've got a bad guy on your hands. We also look at performance in prison or whatever the institutional setting was the person was in before. Individuals who can't, quote, program in prison are very likely not to be able to program in the outside world. There's also various kinds of tests and scales that are used. There's something called the LSIR, which is basically a needs assessment. We can do IQ tests, reading tests, all sorts of inventories that in principle can help us forecast who's at high risk and who's not. And for me, the most important of all, the computer algorithms we do invent predictors. When they develop these profiles, they search through hundreds of thousands of cases and try to find what it is about people who get into trouble versus those who don't, what it is about them that's associated with that kind of activity. And they invent predictors to pick that up. Often we don't even know what those predictors are. We just know that they work. And that raises a more general issue, which is I'm not trying to explain criminal behavior I'm trying to forecast it. If shoe size or sunspots predicts that a person's going to commit a homicide, I want to use that information even if I have no idea why it works. Anytime we do this, and I'm going to take you through a cartoon example, we can make mistakes. Let's take a real simple example. Good guys and bad guys. Bad guy, Darth Vader. Good guy, Luke Skywalker. 
We want to be able to forecast when we look at a set of individuals that we're considering, let's say for parole, who are the likely Darth Vaders, who are the likely Luke Skywalkers. In the language that's often used, if someone is a Darth Vader, they're a positive, it kind of feels upside down, but that's the way it's done. If they're a Luke Skywalker, they're a negative. And the problem that we face is we want to make sure that we don't miss any Darth Vaders. At the same time, we want to make sure that we don't falsely accuse a Luke Skywalker of being a Darth Vader. No matter what the forecasting tool might be, Minority Report being an exception, we're going to make some mistakes. And the idea is to balance these kinds of mistakes, taking into account that some mistakes are worse than others. That's not a statistical point, that's a political point. The stakeholders have to get together and figure out how they want to weigh these things. Basically, what you're trying to do is trade false negatives, that is, failing to find the Darth Vaders, against false positives, that is, indicating that a Luke Skywalker is a Darth Vader. Which is worse? And how much worse is it? In many criminal justice settings, particularly when we're talking about violent crime, the intent is to make sure that there are no Darth Vaders on the street. The individuals making these decisions are highly risk averse. And they are prepared, therefore, and this is the way the algorithm operates, they are prepared to accept weaker evidence that someone is a Darth Vader in the hope that you catch all the Darth Vaders. But the price you pay is that more Luke Skywalkers will be treated as if they're Darth Vaders. This is inevitable. There's no way to avoid these trade-offs. Even when people don't acknowledge the trade-offs, it's built into any forecasting device. It's a critical problem in any of these forecasting enterprises. And as I said, is as much a political and moral issue as it is a statistical issue. Here's an example of some simple results. Cartoon-like, I kept it simple. We're trying to forecast for a group of individuals about to be released on parole whether or not they're going to commit a violent crime versus no crime at all or nonviolent crimes. Two outcomes. In this particular instance, oops, I didn't mean to go there. In this particular instance, a 10 to 1 ratio was established. It's 10 times worse, according to these policymakers and stakeholders, to fail to identify Darth Vader's than to falsely identify a Luke Skywalker as a Darth Vader. I picked this particular set of results not because it's outstanding. I didn't cherry pick. This is sort of typical. Overall, about 8.5% of these individuals will commit a violent crime once released under current practice. Big number, but a small fraction. We're looking for needles in a haystack. How well do we do? Among those who are going to commit a violent crime, we find 62% of them in advance. We know who they are, 62%. For those who are not going to commit a violent crime, we find about the same number, 63%. We can sometimes find 80 or 90% of the people who are going to commit a violent crime before they commit it. Now, it's not quite at the level of minority report. We don't know exactly where or when, but we know within the next, let's say, 18 months, this individual will commit a violent crime. Pretty good, and we're going to be getting better. These are an example of some of the predictors that help us understand who the bad guys are likely to be, and I'm just putting it up here as illustrative. Age is an important predictor. Young, young people are worse. Individuals who can't program in prison, as I mentioned, don't do so well elsewhere. The way the graph is set up, the farther right means a better forecast predictor. The more we move to the left, the weaker. And you can see they fall off pretty quickly. Mail matters. The zip code in which you're released matters because if you're released in an area with other individuals who have gotten into trouble, you're likely to get into trouble too. This is sort of obvious stuff. But unobvious stuff is found as well. We also can learn something about how these variables, these predictors, are related to the outcome. In this simple graph, on the upper left-hand side, that's high risk. Lower left-hand side is low risk. We can see that if we look at age, everybody knows people age out of crime, but exactly how? Turns out that if you're looking at individuals who are being considered for parole, kids who are under 20 are high risk. They are even worse risk into their middle 20s. By the age of 30, however, it starts to drop off. It drops off rapidly until the age of 50 when age doesn't matter anymore. The difference between a 20-year-old and a 30-year-old is enormous in terms of risk. The difference between a 50-year-old and a 60-year-old doesn't matter much, okay? Now, where are we going with this sort of stuff? This is just the beginning. A lot of work is now underway to use not just the official records that are routinely available in criminal justice files, but to use things like GPS monitoring with ankle bracelets. What sort of movements that an individual has, given that they're supposed to wear an ankle bracelet because they're under house arrest, what sort of movements forecast what sort of crime? 
We're also starting to use closed circuit TV pictures. They're all over Chicago. That information can be used to help indicate what sorts of patterns of behavior that we see in the camera forecast crimes. And we're getting pretty clever now about this because these bracelets that I talk about now come with chips. Those chips can be read by those cameras. So if someone with a bracelet comes into one of those stores and commits a crime, we not only have a picture, but we have a positive ID as to who did it. This kind of technology is just now being worked on. It's going to get better and better. I don't see us ever being as effective as Tom Cruise. But with each passing year, we're going to get closer. Thanks very much.